Welcome to the Modern Patient Experience, a show about how U.S. healthcare is adapting to new patient expectations. I'm James Furbush, Director of Marketing at Access One, a company that empowers revenue cycle teams to help all patients effortlessly pay for care in full or over time. In each episode of this show, I interview executives from hospitals and health systems, physicians and nurse leaders, digital health pioneers, and others to better understand what it means to be truly patient-centric. The goal is to serve up new ideas, frameworks, and tactics that will help your organization give your patients the best clinical, financial, and operational experience. And away we go. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to the latest episode of the Modern Patient Experience. As always, I'm James Furbush, your host. Um, I guess this week, I'm very excited. Uh, he is David Bjork. He is the uh, head of CWH Advisors. And also, he probably uh, is going to kill me for saying this, but he's the Grand Puba of the uh, Healthcare Summit in at Jackson Hole. Which, if you're listening to this episode, whenever you're listening to it, just know that, that event uh, was held sort of in early February 2023. We are having this conversation uh, immediately following that. Uh, and so we're just going to let you know uh, that's the case because we're going to be talking a little bit more about that summit that just happened uh, in a couple of minutes. But um, David, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks for joining. James, thanks, man. It's great to be here. You look good. Oh, oh, thank you. It's a uh, lot of early nights to bed and uh, moisturizer around the yeah. eyes. Um, hey, David, I want to start um, because I think CWH Advisors is pretty cool. You guys are a healthcare management consulting firm, but you have a little bit of a different twist on it. And I'd love to just kind of hear, um, share with our listeners sort of your background and what you're up to, what makes CWH uh, unique, and um, we'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, sure thing. Um, so um, uh, just a short little bit about me. I'm a 35-year healthcare guy, um, focused my entire career, uh, helping to do healthcare IT, healthcare services, and um, had a chance to build and scale and transact a bunch of businesses along the way, which has been fun and rewarding. Um, uh, I've had a, uh, the opportunity I've worked in the, uh, tech space I've worked in the services space, focused on payers and providers largely and, um, leveraged, uh, leveraged the, those experiences working in the provider EHR and RCM space. Um, I've done some utilization case disease management stuff for, uh, payers clinical call center, uh, work, I built a business there, uh, and, uh, then spent some time in the DME or durable medical equipment space, and then, um, had a chance to build a business in the early days of, uh, mobile health. So, um, it's been a journey that's been a lot of fun and, um, and by working in a lot of parts of the business, uh, it's given, uh, the, a, a really cool opportunity to touch a lot of parts of healthcare, which has been, uh, fun for me. CWH Advisors, we started eight years ago after, uh, after that, uh, run, I actually stepped out of a business, started, uh, doing some consulting work in order to figure out what my next move was going to be. And, uh, I was about a year into it and I, uh, looked around at the team members that I had dragged along with me and, um, and I said, I think we figured out what we're going to do. We're going to build a better consulting firm. So, uh, we were, we are different. We, um, beside the fact that we just work in healthcare, which is in and of itself, a little unique, um, we do, um, uh, we do something that's a little bit different in that we only invite experienced, successful operators to join our team. So we are a team of pure operators, um, that have worked in various parts of the industry, but it gives us a, a unique perspective on the work we do, our work, uh, kind of. Uh, as you would suspect, follows um, a very more a more execution oriented approach to the uh, stuff that we do for our customers. It, and truthfully, it, we're having a ton of fun. We're building the business quickly. Uh, we're right at the moment. We've got a little more than fifty people in the firm, and um, 
we have this uh, cool opportunity to work with really cool companies, helping them build, grow, and uh, and be successful. So uh, it's uh, that's what we do. We're a professional services firm, and um, it's a uh, it's I would say one of the more rewarding things I've had a chance to do in my career. But do you guys focus on certain companies within the space, like hospitals, health systems, startups, or is it sort of run the gamut? Yeah, so we're uh, we're focused more in the middle market. Um, we do some work with startups, um, but we're pretty selective these days about uh, who we choose to work with that way. Um, we work with investors and executives that run, I would say, middle market businesses all the way up to some of the larger businesses. We work with some of the biggest companies in healthcare, but um, the vast majority of our work is in the mid market. Um, we help investors make wise investment decisions. We help them uh, uh, both uh, investigate and do the business diligence on stuff that they might invest in. We help with integration. We help with execution post, post investment. Um, and we also do a ton of work uh, helping executives and their boards uh, answer strategically related decisions that have, um, uh, that, that require work that the executive team doesn't have bandwidth to do. So uh, we work in the payer space, work in the provider space, work in the healthcare, uh, IT and services space that serve those two markets. But um, we work a little bit more on the provider side than the payer side, just because of the risk shift to providers. There's a lot of work to do there. And so um, we've got a team of people that are tuned into that uh, market segment. It's been good. That's awesome. We should definitely have you back on to, to maybe talk more about that. Actually, the real reason we have you on today is because of this event that you just got back from, which is the healthcare summit at Jackson Hole. This is sort of something that you've been doing. This is your vision for a, a healthcare summit. Um, so tell our audience a little bit about, uh, this event that you've been doing. What's it all about? So, um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, um, it's interesting, right? Um. We're 14 years, uh, from the day that we, uh, that I decided to do something like this. And, uh, it's, it will be interesting just to say, like it, um, it started with a conversation with a colleague that I was sitting with one day, uh, one evening, actually having a beer and, uh, we were working hard, like we all do, uh, together. And then we happened to be, uh, somewhere off site. And then I just said, uh, we work so hard together. We're always at work. We ought to do something. And he is, we ought to get away and just go do something that's not work related just for the sake of hanging out and, um, and getting to know one another outside of the work that we're doing. And, uh, he said, bring it on, let's do it. And, uh, five minutes later, we said, what we really ought to do is invite a few other people and, um, and make something really fun of it. And, um. And that hatched an idea that turned into 16 people, um, showing up in Jackson hole, uh, for a four day sort of long weekend. And, um, and magic happened. Actually, it was really amazing. Um, that was, uh, uh, uh that was 13 years ago. So we just finished, as you just said, we just finished our uh, most recent event um, or gathering, we call it, uh, an executive to retreat now, but, um, uh, we had over a hundred people and, um, it's amazing. It's amazing. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about it. If you like, I'll tell you a little bit about the context of it. I would love to hear, cause I've got some questions. So I'd love to hear more. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, um, we made some rules, uh, early days. It was at the end of the first year, we were just turning to each other saying, should we do this again? And, um, there was, uh, no question, right? It's just, it was such a terrific, uh, start to something that was, uh, immediately unique and different. Um, we said, okay, then, uh, let's make some basic rules. So, uh, it's going to be invitational. Every person gets one invitation per year. And we have a strict, no assholes policy. So if anybody invites an asshole, the asshole never comes back and neither is the person that invited them. So, um, so that has actually curated a very cool group of people. Because so you, 
Super so if there's an asshole that gets invited, the uh, the person who stuck their neck out for that asshole is like yeah. kicked out of the group. They are no longer, they are disinvited. That's the idea. Yeah, I love that. I absolutely love that. Because it's like sort of a celebrated and fun um, thing that we talk about. And, but the truth is actually um, everybody's super um, conscientious of making sure that they're inviting terrific people. Yes. And so, um, uh, anyway, that's helped to sort of characterize what this is. Um, the other thing that we decided is that, um, no business should be done at the conference. So, um, or at the gathering, we don't even call it a conference any longer. So, um, we ask people to sort of leave your business cards in your room, so to speak, and bring yourself and be yourself. Don't be the person that you are uh, expected to be at work. Just be yourself and, um, and meet the people. So it's really, it's a gathering of executives and the, uh, the strong emphasis on relationship building, build deep, lasting, meaningful relationships by doing outdoor, unique experiences together. And it's been, uh, it's really worked. That's awesome. I, I love it. So, so you got the rules, uh, invite only, no assholes, no business, build relationships. Um, that's some solid groundwork. Do you cap it at a certain, have, have you sort of reached a point where you're like, you started at 16 and now it's grown, but are, have you sort of put a cap on it? Because what I am really curious about is. You said something that was interesting that first year, it was like really magical when you got to the end of it. No. And I imagine you want to sort of try to recreate that feeling every year for the people who come into your orbit, who come and attend. And so how do you sort of, how do you sort of build that sort of that feeling of, of magic into an event? Cause we've all gone to events where like. You get to the end, you're like, oh, this was miserable. Like, why did I go? There were too many people. It was, I'm stuck in a hotel conference room. Like it's, you're like, I didn't talk to anyone because people were just running around. And so what do you sort of do to ensure that regardless that that sort of magical feeling for attendees persists? Yeah. Um, so it, the intimacy of the, um, membership and the executives that are there on this retreat is your, as you're saying is super important. And, um, that's something that we have, uh, we have been very careful to make sure that we don't lose. Um, we do it by, um, organizing activities where small groups can be together. So, you know, you're in Jackson hole and I don't know, you know, who that might be listening to this has ever been to Jackson Hole, but I will say Jackson Hole is one of those unique, special places. When you land at the airport, you look at the Tetons, these rugged mountains that are covered in snow. Uh, it's awe inspiring. And, um, and we, we all gather at the base of the mountain in one of the terrific hotels that's right there in Teton village. Um, and that in and of itself just kind of sets the scene for something that's going to be different. Um, we, um, you're skiing, uh, on what you would, uh, what is, uh, known as one of the best mountains in North America, probably the best, um, people that go snowmobiling or snowmobiling through national forests that are amazing. If you're snowshoeing, you're the, what you're seeing is incredible. There's fat tire biking. We're doing all kinds of cool things as small groups. And so the intimacy is retained that way. And then, um, we do a ton of, uh, social gatherings also. So we've, we've got four dinners that, uh, that people are having breakfasts together in small groups. Um, we have, uh, we don't seat any more than eight people at a table. Uh, and usually we try to keep it to six. So things like that we're doing in order to, uh, retain that intimacy. And in fact, uh, we also, as you pointed out, we cap, we're capping it. Um, at, uh, 110. So, um, and the truth is there's really no venue at this mountain that will take a much bigger crowd. <laughs> so we're, uh, we have a natural constraint, but it's, uh, it feels like the right constraint. We're, 
we're at that spot now where we, uh, where it takes time for someone that wants to join our, our group, uh, to get in because, um, uh, we're full and, uh, so people apply with sponsors and then we let people in, uh, as we have room. And so that's fascinating. So I, I'd love to, and I know you want to keep it a little into it, but for the people who are attending, uh, healthcare executives, um, they get invited. Is there sort of a core group that is, who is sort of making those decisions on like who gets in, who gets to attend, uh, if you've come once, do you get like, is it like the masters? Do you get like the automatic invite back to, to, <laughs> to play again? Or, or how does that, how does that sort of work? Yeah. That, that's a good question. So, um, we do allow, once you're a member, you're a member. Um, and, uh, we give, so we've had to create rules around that too, right? So, uh, if you're, if you come every year, you'll get an invite every year. Okay. Members, member, uh, members that come every year get first dibs on the registration for the following year. And then, um, but truth is, is like there is turnover and it's healthy. Not everybody wants to do this year in, year out. Some people are diehards. In other words, they, many people consider this to be one of the most important professional things they do all year long. Uh, because of the networking effect and the relationships that you're establishing. We have 70% of the people that are there are in the C-suite of some of the best companies in healthcare. So, um, so this is a very sort of austere crowd, which is cool. Um, and you, you know, you're surprised when you're sitting on the chairlift speaking with someone that you don't really know that well, and you ask them what they do and invariably people look and say, holy shit, that's pretty cool. I just didn't realize that I was, uh, sitting with. Uh, with you, but, um, the decisions as to who cuts in, who doesn't get in, um, we have a committee that, uh, sort of looks at those, looks at people. We are trying to encourage, uh, the most senior executives to join us so that we can, um, so that the discussion is at a, is at a level that, uh, everybody's, uh, walks away saying, holy crap, that was really, because we've incorporated content into, uh, into the meeting. It's not all, uh, social. So we have a day and a half of really rich content that is, um, facilitated. Um, it's not lectures. It's actually interact, which is really interesting. And, um, one of the things I think you'd find interesting is that, um, we invite a diverse part of healthcare. So it's not like it's all providers or all payers or all technologists and it's not hymns. This isn't, this is, uh, we've got investors, we've got payers, we've got providers, we've got technologists, we've got, uh, professional services people. And, um, and so the dialogue that happens around sort of common thematic things that we talk about is unique because we get a diverse perspective and we always are, uh, encouraging, we're encouraging small group discussion, um, to interact with the topic at hand. Good. Uh, that's such a great pivot. Cause I did want to talk to you. One of the reasons I think I was excited to have you on to talk about this event is less, um, the sort of, of social events, which is great. I think that's a, an awesome way to do an event, which is how to facilitate people actually meeting each other and building those relationships. But part of it is, as you said, 70% of the people who are there are C-suite executives, influential in the industry. Um, and I'm curious for you, what were the, you could start with maybe the content that you guys sort of provided at the event, but I'm kind of curious, were there any sort of themes and discussions that sort of percolated amongst the group, um, for the industry at large, because I'm really kind of curious, what are those conversations that are sort of, they are having on their business. It, healthcare in America is sometimes always turbulent, but it feels like coming out of COVID now with labor shortages and, um, and patient volumes are down and things like that. It, it feels like, um, a very difficult time to be running a healthcare organization. And I'm just very curious, what were some of the themes and discussions that 
were happening um, amongst the people that were attending the event? Yep. Um, um, good question. So uh, just to put some context around this, we, um, we, on one afternoon and then one full morning uh, is when we pull the entire group together and we facilitate discussions around the topics, but the yeah. general topics that you just, uh, that you just introduced. And, um, this year, uh, uh, this year we did a, uh, we did a state of the union, um, sort of a, here are all the big thematic things that are happening in healthcare, just to get everybody's mind moving. And then we, uh, dropped into group discussion in order to, um, identify, um, the most important things that were happening in healthcare, uh, this year. And, uh, and this was a, a little bit of a group think. And so, um, it was interesting. The, um, uh, the discussion, uh, led to like the top handful of things that are in fact important this year. Um, and, I, and so I was not surprised, but, um, it was, uh, it was interesting to just hear that, uh, technical innovation, which might not, uh, be surprised, but I would be, would have everybody voted that would have the biggest impact on 2023. Um, and by the way, the, uh, labor shortages and, uh, the impact of COVID and that was heavily discussed. So, um, but interestingly, tech in innovation, just given what's going on in AI, um, the digital transformation of the consumer experience, the, um, data interoperability and some of the massive changes that are happening there, um, the way that businesses are able to leverage data and use data to make better, uh, better, more, um, more fine-tuned decisions on the consumer or the patient's behalf. Uh, those, that, those were sort of the underpinnings to, uh, being the number one thing being tech innovation. Uh, that was followed actually, interestingly, um, by vertical integration. So the vertical integration inside healthcare meeting, um, payers and providers collaborating, um, payers own providers, uh, more and more, um, yeah. providers are taking risk, uh, and the work, the work between the risk bearing entity and the provider is really kind of coming together in a very productive manner, um, driven largely by good technology. Um, but that we believe is going to be a big, I know it's going to be big. And then, um, the other interesting thing was because of the way that the capital markets are changing, the, um, um, there's a big focus on operational excellence. So money's more expensive. And so therefore, um, businesses are, uh, that are in growth mode are less apt to sort of you can't really financially engineer your growth as much as you used to because money's too expensive. So, so therefore, um, focus on operating excellence and dri driving rigor into a business and driving profitability in the business. That's gonna, that's gonna be, um, a, an important, uh, shift in what we will see this coming year, we believe. And, uh, that was a pretty interesting topic. That's fascinating. I actually. Not surprising to hear that, especially if you're thinking at that level, the C-suite, it's always funny when back at Athena and you would talk about like, what do you guys care about? And you hear stuff on like our bond rating and they go deep into these sort of things where we're like, oh, I would never have considered that. Right. Um, the cost of, of raising money or the cost of money going up, um, not surprising to hear that, but, um. I'd love to hear the downstream side of that on the operational excellence. What were some of the things that were talked about on that? Like, cause that's such a huge thing across an organization to like really run efficiently across departments, uh, revenue cycle, not leaving money on the table, providers seeing more patients in a timely manner. Um, but yeah, I'd love to, to hear kind of your thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, and at a conference, like what we run, uh, the depth of getting kind of digging into that, lifting the hood and sort of understanding all that, that's not really happening at that conference, but, yeah. um, 
But our business, CWH Advisors, we see this day in and day out. Um, businesses are driving to be profitable and businesses are driving to um, change, change as rapidly as they can to having the kind of um, operational excellence that are, that's necessary in order to drive profits into the business. Um, and where we work, like I was saying earlier, we work a lot on the provider side. There are a lot of um, components to um, to making a provider a better uh, a better uh, organization within the healthcare system, including um, because everybody's taking risk, increasingly taking risk, knowing how to take risk, knowing how to contract for risk, and knowing how to operate um, in a way that allows you to win in a risk based contract. This is not easy stuff. And um, it's forcing providers, as an example, it's forcing providers to act like payers. And um, and the kind of, like I said, I'll overuse the word, but the rigor that's necessary to be able to figure out how do you um, how do you assess and stratify a population, and how do you care manage against that population? So um, the um, that uh, operating rigor inside. A health system or a provider organization, a specialty provider organization, all of which have, um, in many cases, especially for uh, specialty providers, that good investments, uh, private equity investments, and other strategic investments that have been made behind businesses like that, um, the drive for uh, the drive to profitability is a unique, one. and um, and figuring out how to operate and succeed in a um, in an environment where risk has been taken is tricky. And uh, so uh, it just requires a different type of operating. And, uh, and that's super interesting. Yeah. Um, it, it goes a long way to explaining why it's 10 years on now. I think everyone keeps talking about like value-based, like what is value-based care going to get here? And it's like, it's not like so that you just flip the switch on overnight to get right. Um, was there anything surprising about the conversations and sort of the discussions you heard amongst uh, people intending that sort of was eye-opening to you or, or sort of, I was like when I'm in a room with smarter people than me, which is not hard to do, but it's when you hear uh, those conversations that sort of flip that light bulb and you have that like light bulb moment where it's just like, oh my God, I, I never considered that way of thinking or I never heard that before. Um, that is going to sort of resonate with me. And I'm curious if you sort of had any moments, uh, during the conference with any of the people that you sort of interacted with, um, as you're sort of heading into to 2023, uh, this year. Um, I'm not sure if there was anything that made me sort of jump out of my chair, but we had probably, um, six large health systems that were represented there by some of the most senior people inside those health systems. We had, um, Walgreens was there. Walters core was there. Uh, uh, we had, uh, we just had people from all over the place, but, um, I think it was really, um, eye opening to hear, uh, how businesses that are, um, or health systems that is in particular how they are starting to think more innovatively about the manner in which they are uh, addressing the consumer, the requirements, the consumer experience. It's really front and center. Um, and I, we heard uh, from several health systems how they are uh, sort of reorganizing their, how they face off against the population they serve with various different types of of um, primary care. So the incorporation of uh, virtual care, super important. The migration of being able to deliver care in the home, super important. And, um, and uh, uh, being able to pay attention to uh, different types of the different slices of the population. You've got the, a younger commercial population, you've got an older Medicare population, you have a Medicaid population. All those uh, different um, cohorts need to be dealt with different. And I think that um, 
I'm seeing that sort of shift in thinking um, and evidenced by a reorganization of these, uh, of, you know, of health systems in order to address those different uh, types of, of populations. And that I found to be really interesting, not surprising at some level, but I guess, you know, different than you might have heard of a couple of years ago, at least, which is pretty cool. Certainly the notion of them acting with a sense of urgency that they need to reorganize their divisions or how they do their business in order to, yeah, deliver care at the home. You can't treat telehealth like it's primary, like just like a primary care visit because it is sort of this very different thing. It's a different interaction with the patient, et cetera, just like home care is different from kind of the brick and mortar, urgent care, all those things. Um, I mean, it is interesting to hear that maybe they're moving with a sense of urgency in order to better operationalize those different places of care. So that is fascinating to me. And you heard that from a few different um, places that are starting to think like that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, that's very cool. And that's great because I think, um, again, I think sometimes too with like healthcare, it's like, at least in my experience, it's like sometimes it's often like, especially when it comes to the consumer, the patient, that, that sort of shifting thing, it's like always trying to put a square peg in a round hole or whatever that expression is, right? Like, it's always like, the patient says they want this, we'll give them this and now nah, that'll be good enough even if it's 60 percent of what they really want yeah. That's what we have. yeah um like i definitely don't need 17 different patient portals for every provider that i go to see um that's that you're touching on some of the things that we think about as a business um cwh advisors um we have a point of view uh of, in terms of like what are the most meaningful things, uh, happening in healthcare and whatever, what's 2023, 2024 have in store for, uh, healthcare. And you're touching on one of them, which is this, uh, modernized digital consumer experience, transformation of the consumer experience by using, uh, by leveraging digital assets is going to change everything and, um, and sort of the unification of uh, what a payer, uh, 20 portals, not going to be the case anymore. And it can't be because the consumer will demand something different. And, um, and the reality is that in today's technical world, that's, there's no reason why that cannot happen. And, um, and as you, if you start to think about the impact that has on, um, a provider organization that has taken risk and now has, uh, you know, added incentive to keep people happy, uh, and to improve access, to improve the ability to schedule the ability to communicate with their doctor. Like, how do you pay your bill? How do you understand your bill? How do you, know, you can go on and on, um, uh, including like, what are my benefits? What do my benefits cover and what do they not cover? Now, all of a sudden, that's the question you have to go ask your payer. Well, that's old. It doesn't need to be that way anymore. Um, some of the interoperability regulations that are happening right now are going to open the channels up to, to enable that uh, to be uh, unified in a single port. I think you're going to see that this year. The next. I mean, it, that's such a huge, the met digital transformation, that aspect of it is such like a monumental shift. It is almost like I could even ask you because you mentioned 2023, 2024, and it's like that change alone could be three years, like three years of work for a health system to like yeah. get to that place, um, yeah. is how monumental that sort of shift can be. Um, what are some of the other ones that you're kind of thinking about? related to the patient experience or just in general with your work with CWH, um, are there kind of one or two other sort of top priorities that you're thinking about for 2023 and 2024? 
Yeah, this is one of the cool things about being in a firm like uh, like the one that we're building here is that uh, we get it. We get this cool opportunity to work with businesses, asking and answering those kinds of questions, um, and then figuring out actually how to pull the trigger on making them work. Um, but yeah, in addition to that whole sort of digital transformation of consumer uh, experience, I think um, one of the things that we see as uh, thematically um, that will thematically sort of impact everything is this migration of care to the home. So more broadly, it's uh, transition in site of care. So you can say that, but, um, but more specifically the transition of site of care or the, the migration of care to the home, that's a huge issue. We get, the Medicare population is growing like crazy. Um, and as soon as there's a, uh, an acute care event. Um, uh, an older senior finds themselves in a place where they hadn't necessarily been before and they need all kinds of care and, um, and keeping that person in the hospital is not a good thing. So, and the truth is they don't have to be in the hospital because they can be cared for at home, but, um, but orchestrating the care in the home is tricky and it's not, it's one of these areas where, um, our industry has not figured that out yet, even though there's a lot of initiatives to care for people in homes. So this hospital home, DME is becoming a bigger thing. RPM, you're uh, monitoring patients in the home. Um, MTM, you're monitoring, uh, the adherence to drug therapy and, um, and home care is kind of all of a sudden sexy again, because of the fact that this is all happening, it goes on and on, but, yeah. um, the, uh, there are an increasing number of businesses that say, I want to take risk for the post-acute uh, care of a patient, and I'm going to do it by orchestrating um, and fine-tuning the uh, in-home care approach and having all those things sort of dovetail and work together. It's a fascinating area. So I would say one of our points of view is we really like that. We yeah. really like that area. Um, the other, uh, the other thing that I think about when you ask a question like that would be the use of data is, um, is just remarkably, uh, different these days than it's ever been because, um, the release of, uh, interoperability, uh, requirements now and the release of, uh, the ability for consumers to sort of consent to the release of their own data for the yeah. use in the health system, that's going to change everything. It's going to allow. Uh, it's going to allow people to be more informed about, uh, a patient's care and a patient's situation, um, uh, more completely. And then, um, of course there's better and better tech, AI tech and other tech that, that will allow the use of that data to be sort of, um, synthesized in a way that it's going to surface, it's going to surface issues. It's going to allow us to care for people in a sort of a highly personalized manner. And, uh, and it's going to enable providers and payers, uh, to be better at what they do. And, if, uh, if it's done properly, it's going to be remarkably different. So, yeah. um, so those are some of the things that we think about, um, as we look at the year in front of us, there's others, of course, but, but those are our, our big ones, right? It's like digital transformation for the patient experience, home care in the home better use, uh, a better use of data. Um, those are all game changers. Um, yeah, if we can get it right, the system can not mess it up. Um, David, this has been a fantastic conversation. I'm really glad you were able to join us, talk about the conference, but then talk about so much more, uh, where can people who are listening, if they want to learn more about you learn more about CWH or learn more about the healthcare summit. Um, where can they kind of find out more about, about you and your work? Thanks, man. James has been fun being together. So, um, if you want to know more about CWH advisors, it's simple. www.cwhadvisors.com. Uh, if you want to learn more about the summit, it's www.healthcaresummitatjacksonhole.com. Uh, watch a video or two, you'll get the vibe. Um, and, uh, 
This has been fun. Nice talking to you. Awesome. What about you though? Are you on LinkedIn, TikTok? Are you on the socials? I'm a LinkedIn guy I, and I don't do any socials. So, uh, that's just me. <laughs> All right. Awesome. David, thanks for joining the show. I really appreciate you stopping by and, uh, we'll have to have you on, uh, sometime soon again. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, James. I like that. Be well.